Hey, machine learning enthusiasts, we are moving on to chapter nine, support vector machines. As you can see, our learning objectives en encompasses going through these terms, maximal margin classifier, support vector classifier and support vector machines. Looking at this sentence in the middle, historically support vector machines was an approach for classification that was developed in the 1990s. And it's been pretty popular for some of the features that we're going to see in this chapter. And we'll go over these terms as we go through the slides here. It's probably useful for us to start with some of the mathematics of it all. We're thinking of a hyperplane. And in two-dimensional space, the image that we see in the top left, a hyperplane is a line. And if we go to three-dimensional space, the image in the top right, a hyperplane is, is a plane. But what we really mean is if we have P dimensions, we have a surface that is P minus one dimensions that somehow separates or splits the space. Formulaically, if uh, we're thinking of the image there in the top right, we have a 2D hyperplane in 3D space. In standard form, the equation of a line looks like this, where we have some coefficients, the three variables, and that's set equal to a constant. From linear algebra, we may also need to think about hyperplanes being defined as an inner product, again, uh, set equal to itself in, in this notation here. As the pictures imply, what we're thinking of doing for classification purposes is to use this hyperplane in a way where the data on one side of the plane is identified one way, say green dots, and the data on the other side of the plane is identified another way, say in red squares. So we're doing this process where we're trying to create a separating hyperplane. We're going to label some of the data as negative one and label some of the data as positive one. Every time we get a new observation, we literally give it one of those labels. So we think of a situation, maybe the picture there on the left was the blue and purple dots. And we wanna create a separating hyperplane to create some sort of boundary, some sort of border between them. Once we create that hyperplane, the image on the right, everything on one side will be labeled blue, everything on the other side will be labeled purple. For the convention in these diagrams coming from the textbook, We'll use the blue observations labeled as positive one and the pink observations, or I think the captions say purple, the purple observations labeled as negative one. What then happens in the geometry, the mathematical geometry, is that when you have the equation of a plane, that's going to be positive for the blue dots and negative for the purple dots. And if you think about how multiplying by one and negative one works out, if you put that in front of the equation of the plane, the hyperplane now has the property that this product, the plane times the positive or negative one, has to then be positive for all the data values. From there, we start to wonder, though, if we look at this picture on the left, 
like what we had with linear regression, there's technically an infinite number of places where we could draw that hyperplane. So we need some further consideration to help us figure that out. We can also consider the magnitude of the data where, um, summarizing that dot there, some dots are going to be close to the hyperplane, some dots are going to be very far from the hyperplane. Thus, this motivates the notion of the maximum maximal margin classifier. As I scroll through this slide, I actually repeat this picture twice for convenience. The intuition here is we're going to put the hyperplane in the location where, as you can see in the image, we are trying to create as much distance between the plane and the data observations as possible to create a maximal margin. Assuming a maximum exists, this will greatly tell us where the hyperplane should be. We're computing the perpendicular distance from each training observation to the hyperplane, and the smallest of those distances will be called the margin. As you can see, we're trying to maximize that margin. From there, the classification is still the same. Everything that was a positive number is labeled as on the blue dot team. Everything was a negative number is labeled on the purple dot team. In this image, we kind of get a sense that some dots or some observations matter more than others in determining where the hyperplane is. In this image, the margin, the, the black arrows, are only connected to three of the dots because the, the distance for any of the other data points is much greater, but does not affect where the hyperplane is. The observations which determine the margin, that is, as you can see with the black arrows, these three are now the locations of what we call the support vectors, almost literally propping up the, the plane in existence. The other data points would be even more clearly identified as blue or purple and thus do not need this extra specification of being called a support vector. In other words, in this image, there are three support vectors. Briefly going over the mathematics behind this, where over the space of all the plane coefficients and the margin M, we're trying to maximize the margin M. Now, when you have an equation of a plane in the linear algebra of it all, technically you can multiply that by any number um, it wouldn't necessarily move you off the plane. So to have a unique equation of a plane there, we we need to sub, we need to include some sort of constraint. So we could say that the two norm of the coefficients is equal to one or normalized. 
we also, in addition to wanting all the classifications with the Y labels, positive one, negative one, in addition to wanting all the products of this form to be positive, we also want them to be even further separated from the plane. So we say we want them to be bigger than the margin. In other words, just to restate, M is the distance, the margin that we see in between the dashed lines and the solid line. And we're trying to make that margin as big as possible. However, this maximal margin classifier, as you could imagine, um, did not necessarily survive the test of time. It's not what we're going to study directly moving forward. Because let's consider a couple of different things here. Looking at this image with the blue and purple dots, um, apologies for the color choice if that does not quite work for us. But we quickly realized that there are many situations where the data is not separable by a linear hyperplane. So the ideas from the previous couple of slides do not uh, quite work here. And then also briefly considering this pair of images, whenever you add a new data point, it greatly could or it could greatly affect where the hyperplane goes. And what starts to happen then is we have to go back and consider our bias variant, variance trade-off. If we have this system with the hyperplane that could move quite greatly, it's probably going to create a lot of variance in our testing sets uh, later on. that motivated the notion of a support vector classifier. That even in situations where we cannot create an obvious hyperplane to separate the data, we, we might still have a similar approach. And also, it turns out we might not want to go after 100% separation of the data in that way. And this is to avoid the sensitivity with the individual observations. So the strange idea that people realized in the development of this was that it's okay to misclassify a few observations. And it might help later on with the classification in the test set. So we're now looking at what's called a support vector classifier, sometimes called a, called a soft margin classifier, where again, it allows some of the data to be on the wrong side of the classification, on the wrong side of the hyperplane. Briefly going over the mathematics of the support vector classifier. We are once again trying to maximize the margin, have a unique set of coefficients. We want this product to be positive and beyond the margin furthermore. But we have some adjustment here. This is the, the new factor. We have some epsilons. Each epsilon will be positive. And we're going to have that the epsilons themselves are coming from, if you think of it kind of like a budget, they're coming from a cost variable. At this moment, I wrote as uh, 
probably would have preferred to say that in a different order. The epsilons are slack variables. That is, they're going to be variables that help us with the margin a bit, but for data points that might happen to be on the wrong side of the hyperpoint. We have a trio of situations. If epsilon is zero, it actually reverts us back to the previous set of math equations. The observation is then on the correct side of the margin. That's that's what's supposed to happen. If epsilon is greater than zero, the observation is going to be on the wrong side of the margin. And furthermore, if epsilon is relatively large and is greater than one, the observation is on the wrong side of the of the hyperpoint. What's going to happen is that we want to keep these epsilons as small as possible because that's affecting how many observations are misclassified or classified incorrectly. So that's part of the optimization problem. We're dealing with these epsilons and we're going to try to keep them below some sort of cost C. If we had the cost be zero, then that enforces the maximum margin classifier that we saw in the previous slides with zero misclassifications. But alas, for realistic situations, we may have to have a non-zero cost and then have some cases of misclassification. So what that looks like then is, say in the picture on the top right, the solid black line is our hyperplane classifier. But as you maybe could see, uh, while most of the blue dots on the top left, there is a blue dot on the other side as well. Similarly, while most of the purple dots on the bottom right, there are a couple of purple dots that still exist on the top left. What this sequence of pictures implies or is talking about here is that the cost function is affecting the margin, that is the distance between the solid line and the dashed lines. Let me double check the caption here real quick. In the top left, we allow a, a lot of the so-called cost capital C. And there may be a point, or actually, sorry. The cost uh, uh, creates a quite a bit of a margin, which might be good for some observations, but also allows for more misclassifications. Thus, in the image in the top left, we see about five blue dots on the wrong side of the hyperpoint. As we go through the images top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right, the authors reduced the amount of cost available. And what would happen then in the process is that the margins would become smaller. With the smaller margins, we're probably misclassifying fewer of the data points. However, as we mentioned earlier, there may be situations that cannot be completely separated, or you do not want a situation where the hyperplane can move a lot when you bring in the test data. Uh, 
So at some point there is maybe an optimal sense of this cost. And thus that becomes the tuning parameter of our situation. Updating our terminology a bit more, the data points that truly affect where the hyperplane is and the margin, that's what's going to be called the support vector. And that could be data points that are correctly classified or misclassified. But in other words, the dots that are close to the hyperplane are grading the support vectors. The motivation for having this broader approach to, to classification into what we're now calling the support vector classifier is that this cost C controls the or the bias variance trade-off that we mentioned at the beginning of the book. When C is large, it could create high bias, low variance. When C is small, conversely, we could have low bias, high variance, implying that there's some optimal value of C somewhere in there in a bias variance trade-off. One of the reasons why the support vector classifier became pretty popular is that compared to other classification methods, such as the linear discriminant analysis, we could focus on a subset of the data as far as the calculations are concerned, because only a small subset are the support vectors are truly affecting where the hyperplane classification is happening. As more and more people double check the mathematics of it all, they realize that support vector classifiers are closely related to logistic regression. And this is nice because it has low sensitivity to, to observations that are far away from the decision boundary. I don't think we cover the mathematics in this connection all that much. The textbook does briefly dedicate a section to that, but if anybody's interested, that's a, a deeper dive mathematically. Now, like regression, we quickly realized that using a straight line is just one choice available to us. We have other types of functions out there. So we could consider making a decision boundary, but in a nonlinear shape. To facilitate this argument, we're going to briefly mention a quadratic system here. In addition to the variables x1, x2, all the way up to xp in p dimensions, what's considered the quadratic forms, x1 squared, x2 squared, all the way up to xp squared. We're still trying to maximize the margin, but we have to now deal with all these coefficients here. the rest of the constraints are similar as before. The authors note that the decision boundary is linear, but usually the solutions are not linear. So that's kind of motivating the quadratic forms here. The issue is that going up from one to two dimensions in our vector space, we've already doubled the amount of features and we're asking our computer processes to discern even more coefficients. So we see or foresee a problem that could enlarge really quickly 
and may become unmanageable computationally. As you can imagine, for folks uh, 30 years ago with computers back then, this was especially true. And this computational time is still an, an issue for these types of problems today. We're going to broaden our thought processes to support vector machines. Basically, people were scientists were more clever about how we're going to think about this. Well, let me try to briefly explain. The SVM support vector machine is an extension of the support vector classifier. And, and instead of some equation like this, we're going to think of what we have over there as, as, a, as a term that we could adjust or use in different ways. But before I get to that, remember our motivation. We want to be able to enlarge the feature space, maybe create a better classifier, maybe in a nonlinear decision boundary. But we want to create a situation where the computer can still manage to handle the calculations. Briefly calling upon the linear algebra, we have the inner product between two vectors. And the support vector classifier, at least for the linear example, has this form here, where we have the inner product and some coefficients. The nice thing is, at the time, when we had n of these coefficients along with the intercept, we would only need n choose two inner products to do that calculation. We call that a lot of the motivation or hope for the support vector machines is that here in this image, we had three support vectors. The support vectors are the ones that are close to the hyperplane in a way that they are determining where the hyperplane is and what the margin is. The observations that are far away from the hyperplane uh, should be in a situation where they actually do not affect the calculations anymore. So if we could set the coefficients to be zero for the observations that are beyond the margin, then we're only dealing with this form for locations that are the support vectors. However, we quickly realized that we might need something more advanced than a linear hyperpoint. So we need to update what goes on on this side of the equation. And when we utilize different types of functions for some sort of procedure, we usually call this in mathematics a kernel. putting a lot of these words together, the kernel is this inner product for linear situations. For higher dimensions, similar to polynomials, we could use this kernel here, where D is the degree. So one dimensions, two dimensions, three dimensions, et cetera. 
And that creates what we discussed at the beginning of the textbook called flexibility. Anywho, when you have these ideas coming together, you have some sort of kernel here with coefficients. If we have a situation where we could focus on just a few of the data points and have the support vectors, all this together is called a support vector machine. One of the most popular kernels out there is, is called a radial kernel. And the way I picture this, as you can see in the picture, is that we have a local maximum, a, a hilltop, and the, the height disappears quite quickly as we move away from the local maximum. The equations that usually create this situation, as you can see there on the top right, are the exponentials with negative signs with x squares and y squares or quadratics thereof. Expanding upon this, our kernel for a radial basis is this exponential form, a negative sign, the quadratics, or yeah, the kind of a Euclidean distance. And it's creating an image like we see at the top of the page. The motivation for this is that for data points that are far away, from a test observation, say far away being the dark blue in the picture, the values will be very small. Or working with this gamma coefficient here. Summarizing this, the radial kernel, it, the motivation is that it exhibits local behavior with respect to other observations. So let's see that in action. On the left, we have a support vector machine made with the degree three kernel. On the right, we see a support vector machine made with a radial kernel. They both do an attempt at the job of classifying the data. This, of course, is a controlled or synthetic setting where we know the purple data and the blue data in advance. This is a typo. Computationally, the advantage of using a kernel that is the motivation for the support vector machine is that we only have to compute and choose two kernel functions along the way. And we could restate that for radial kernels, the computations focus mainly in a local area and stuff that's far away is not anywhere near as important for the computation. Sorry, how is it that the, for the royal kernels case, that the feature space is infinite dimensional? Uh, 
Uh, why, why is that the case? Let me think about that. So the question was um, in this wording here that from this is probably from the textbook or maybe from a previous cohort member, the radio kernels are infinite dimensional. And the idea may be that when you're dealing with this system, we're kind of thinking of a circle, thinking something analogous to a radius. And the circle itself could go off in and infinite number of directions radially. So that might be perhaps the complication. So for example, this picture on the top right, the picture itself is two dimensional, but the, but the computation is actually assuming a sphere, the radius is going in could be going in three dimensions pretty easily going out outside of the picture. But that's just one idea. Did you have any more ideas or thoughts on that? Mm, not really, I didn't quite get uh, why, uh, I mean, how does the infinite dimension come up? Because even if we're still if we are thinking about the, a circle or, or really any generalization of a circle, uh, it is still finite in dimensions. Maybe it's explained in the, in the video of the previous cohort or, or, or whoever wrote that part in the text. Yeah. Another aspect mathematically is when you have functions that look like this, e to the negative x squared. Uh, when you graph that, that's a horizontal asymptote going out towards infinity. And these kernels, their um, domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. So that's a part of the complication. Now, having spent this chapter classifying the data into blue dots and purple dots, it's natural to think about what would happen if we have more than two classes. Overall, the answer is probably not all that satisfactory, but just to mention some of the ideas out there. We could have a one versus one approach that would construct K choose two support vector machines where K is the number of classes. An observation is classified into each of the K choose two classes. And then you tally up how many times it appears in, in each class. The case class will be coded as positive one anything else would be coded as negative one. So then the data point is classified to whatever class that is that it got assigned to most often. Now, when there are a lot of classes in your classification problem, you might want an one versus all approach. This time around, only K support vector machines are fitted as opposed to K choose two, which is 
approximately k squared. You're comparing the k class versus the remaining k minus one. So it's creating a kind of a binomial situation there. You have your parameters doing your usual coding of positive one and negative one. And then assigning to class K where the calculation in this format is the largest. However, I have a hunch that people don't really spend as much time thinking about separating to more than two classes in this way, in this support vector machine way, because in future chapters, we might see a different approach altogether. What I thought we would do to finish out this hour is to look at the first half of the chapter lab. And the nice thing is the folks in the previous cohort worked with the tidy models framework. So we'll see how this all comes together. From the textbook, they created some synthetic data. And that would be classified into either blue dots or purple dots. or in this case, uh, blue or red. So remember at first, the hope would then to try to create one hyperplane that completely separates the blue and red dots. The synthetic data here, especially if you set the seed in advance, quickly creates a situation where that optimal is not possible. So we're gonna to have to allow for a little bit of misclassification. I didn't quite understand why the previous cohort saved a set of this data for now and brought in, oh, sorry, this is the test data. And they brought this in as, as a file and we have the test data here. That is, we're gonna have a support vector machine running through this, maybe maybe a linear hyperplane, and then have the same support vector machine dealing with this test data. The code in tidy models, it feels a bit similar to what we've seen in some regression examples. We're gonna Ask for a support vector machine. Let's we'll start with a degree one linear hyperplane. We are going to use it for classification purposes. And we're going to bring up an engine called the, the kernel lab, the kernel laboratory. Now, as we said a, a while back, we need to set a cost that will affect how much misclassification can happen. But we do want some misclassification to be allowed just in case to help us avoid variance later on. So if we set a cost of 10, we'll save that as this model here. We get a parsnip model object. We have this class, KSVM. We have that cost, just so we remember that it's there. We have a degree one hyperplane. And what happens is that we're going to get seven support vectors from this calculation. 
the extract the fit flows right into the base R plot function. And we could see from the original data where, let me think ahead a bit. If I remember correctly, this is some of the support vectors. The issue is that we should have seven of them. This might be the support vectors, but the ones that were misclassified. Uh, do we count the support vectors uh, also including a possible repetition? Like if there is some weight uh, for the calculation, so do we count them only as unique points? Yes, thank you. For comparisons, because even if we compute some sort of metric on the error at the moment, we should look at more than one model so we could compare things. For comparisons, let's make a different model, let's a different cost. This model had a cost of 10. This second model will have a cost of 10 to the negative one power. Still going with a degree one linear hyperplane. This time around, we'll have 16 support vectors instead of seven. And we'll have this situation here. The classifications, as you can see, are now dots and triangles. And we have the values from the that form the betas times the variables in the red and the blue. So this is implying, of course, that the dots should be more in the blue region. The triangle should be more in the red region. It's just that we have this one circled, circular dot here on the far left that happens to be in the red region. Find out one more model, which have a cost of 10 to the negative two power, linear hyperplane. We're going to get 20 support vectors. And we're going to get this picture here. So with that said, we could have different values of the cost, but we need to find the, the best version of that. In the tidy models framework, we're going to make a workflow using this support vector machines specification. We're going to leave a column or of cost values, but in a way where we could tune that later. With the motivation to reduce variance as we go into the testing data. We could also do cross-validation. And you could probably manually type in cost values like we did above, cost values being 10, 10 to the negative one, 10 to the negative two. But you can also have a preset formula help you with that as well. So what if we tried out these cost values here? Let's say 10 of them. 
So then we're going to apply these 10 cost values, create a, a grid. with the support vector machine workflow with the cross validation and again with the cost values. Now with these larger machine learning applications, the runtime might be quite large. So people in the, in the previous cohort mentioned that they did not necessarily want to run this live in front of people, so they saved the results in a file or have that option available to us. We could see that, um, be careful what you, of the numbers on the vertical axis. We could see that for some of the cost values, the accuracy is higher than others. There's actually a long discussion about ROC curves, radio operator curves in this chapter. I'm not gonna go over it right now. Oddly enough in this example, for some reason, the area under the ROC curves was virtually constant for all the cost values. So we're gonna stick with accuracy for the remainder of this discussion. From there, helper function that literally says select the best model based on the accuracy metric. We could get that final model, apply it to the data, and get the optimal fit. Now, testing the optimal fit. On the test data, we could create a confusion matrix. Remember, with the confusion matrix, we want the correct classifications on the main diagonal for reasons that we discussed to handle the bias variance trade off. We allow that some misclassifications can happen. So, in this case, we have the three misclassifications. And when we compute the accuracy, we get an accuracy of 85% from the so-called best fit model. In comparison, for the model where we had a cost of 10 to the negative two, we have slightly different results and the accuracy was lower at 70%, which makes sense because this accuracy above came from the so-called best fit model. The textbook authors, out of curiosity, had a situation where the data were linearly separable, that it was, it was obvious that you could draw a straight line and separate between the blue and red dots. I don't know why that's not appearing here. But the idea was when you have the clear separation, the support vector machine should definitely do a, a good job, even across different cost allowances. and you should get very high accuracy values. Let's see, Lucio, did you have any more thoughts or commentaries on, on this here or the chapter? Uh, in the chapter, uh, yes, uh, for example, as we saw in the previous one, uh, for trees, uh, they also, similar to the algorithm for the chapter, they also had a high variance. And the way that we fixed that was to use bagging. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to add that it turns out that, well, naturally you can do the same process for this uh, algorithm using pre-use bootstrap, considering many, many subsets 
and then train different uh, support vector machines. But it turns out, and, and I am linking the, the article that I am referencing, it turns out that there is really, we don't really gain too much in terms of accuracy when bugging this, this type of algorithm. For three, of course, it did happen, but that was because trees on their own, they were not as good for classification. But uh, for example, or here in this paper, reading some comparisons for the Irish data set, we only use a single uh, well, support vector machine when we have a classification rate of approximately 97%. Uh, however, if we do the bagging uh, and then we choose different uh, ways to to get to a, a, pre, a, a prediction for the classification, that is maybe some majority voting or another another procedure, then still the classification rate using bagging, uh, it only increases uh, 1%. So basically it went up from 97 to 98. So uh, there seems to be not quite uh, a significant gain in using bagging because on its own, despite the high variance of this support vector machine algorithm, it was a good enough predictor on its own. Awesome, thank you for that insight. Um, for folks that are followed along with the videos, et cetera, what we looked at so far was the first half of the chapter lab, as you could see, the support vector classifier what we will move on to next week is the second half of the lab, the support vector machine. We'll see some of those kernels in action and talk about some of the exercises as well.